Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 2nd of June, and because it was billed last week, it's a really quick update this week. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any of the updates you care about the most. New videos this week, so I just created one video, but it was all about how I can maximize Azure reliability as I move into more important, maybe mission critical apps running in Azure, what are some of the things I have to think about to really maximize the reliability, the resiliency to things that can happen beyond just, hey, put a VM in each zone, how I start thinking about service principles, identities, global balancing, where were my secrets, just really more details about more advanced scenarios. So on to what's new on the compute side, so for Azure Kubernetes services, the Azure CNI Celium has now gone GA. So the whole point here is that Azure Kubernetes service by default doesn't come with a native container network interface. Now there are ones available, there's the Azure CNI, there's a Kubelet, there's Azure CNI overlay, or you can bring your own. And so the Azure CNI Celium is a bring your own. It's powered by that Celium networking solution. So it's using the control plane of the Azure CNI, but the data plane capabilities of Celium. So I get faster service routing, I can get more efficient network policy enforcement, I get better observability, I can get larger clusters, so more pods, more nodes, more services. It has different IP options. So I can use the IP addressing of the subnet or a separate overlay IP space. It is Linux only. And actually in partnership with this, there's also now Celium Enterprise available in the marketplace. So I can deploy that to an existing cluster using the Azure CNI powered by Celium, or I can deploy a brand new one to get the enterprise set of capabilities. I now have eight terabyte MV2 virtual machines uh, in GA. So these are the monster uh, size virtual machines. So with this eight terabyte option, it's 416 virtual CPUs, 7.6 gigabytes of memory, four terabytes of virtual storage and 32 gigabits per second of network bandwidth. And the whole point of this offering is it sits in between the existing six terabyte or six terabyte and 12 terabyte options. And obviously this is a huge amount of memory. This is really focused of those scenarios where it's some in-memory workload. I just need a massive amount of memory available to me. And also, the NG ADS V620 series VMs are in preview. So these are GPU-based virtual machines, and this is all about a gaming experience running in Azure, or maybe a graphics accelerated virtual desktop infrastructure running in Azure. So the little A means it's AMD based, so it's an AMD Radeon uh, Pro V620 GPU and the AMD Epic 7763 CPUs. But it's all about generating and streaming uh, high quality graphics. Now those GPUs, you have different options. I can get a quarter of a GPU, a half a GPU, a full GPU, um, but they're available now in certain regions in preview. On the networking side, so the Azure Load Balancer per VM limit has been removed. So in the past, I remember I can have external load balancers and internal load balancers. So it either had the, load, the Azure Load Balancer standard would have a public front end, or it could have internal private front ends and a virtual machine could be a member of one of each, and that's all it could be. This is very common that, hey, if I'm part of an internal load balancer, I would have no default internet egress path, so I would also add it to an external load balancer. Or I could use something like, and there's other uh, egress services I could use, and that gateway, for example. But I can only have one of each. A VM could only be part of one public and one internal. They've removed that limit. So now a VM could be a member of multiple public Azure load balancers, multiple internal, any combination, up to whatever the limit of the load balancer is. On the storage side, so zone redundant storage managed disks are just now available in more regions. Now this is for the premium SSD and standard SSD, not the premium SSD V2, that's completely different, but now they've added it to Brazil South, UK South, East US, East US 2 and South Central US regions. 
And really the, the whole point here with managed disks is it abstracts away the underlying storage account. The managed disk is just a first party Azure resource with native capabilities like snapshotting. And the ZRS means the three copies of the data and now distributed over the three availability zones that will be exposed to my subscription. So I have a better resiliency to some kind of zonal data center type failure. And then Azure Files has had a scalability improvement for Azure Virtual Desktop is a big scenario, but it could be any others that do root folder uh, level handles. So the root directory handles. Because the whole point here is in the past, there was a maximum of 2000 root directory handles were possible. They've increased that up to 10,000. And that's both standard and premium file shares. So while this is a big deal for Azure Virtual Desktop is FS Logics, the way it works is it creates one of those root directory handles for each profile. So I can only have 2000 profiles per Azure file share. Well now I could have 10,000. But any other type of workload that relies on a root directory handle would also benefit from this five times improvement to the number of root directory handles I can now have. And then miscellaneous, Azure AD cross-tenant sync has gone GA. So this is that ability that if I'm an organization with multiple Azure AD tenants, maybe I did an acquisition, now I can automate that process of users from one tenant being added as guests to the other tenant, being made part of groups. It could be in both directions by setting up two um, cross-tenant sync configurations. But now it's GA, so I can feel comfortable using that in production. And that was it. I said it was a quick week. As always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.